Marilyn Fry's wonderful collection of essays, The Politics of Reality, contains an essay entitled Some Reflections on Separatism and Power. She begins this essay by expressing both the significance of separatism and the elusiveness of this significance. She says, it has always been for me somehow a mercurial topic which, when I tried to grasp it, would softly shatter into many other topics. The essay that follows is her attempt to capture this significance. Marilyn defines separatism as, in a feminist context, separation of various sorts or modes from men and from institutions, relationships, roles and activities which are maldefined, maldominated and operating for the benefit of males and the maintenance of male privilege. Where, however, and this is crucial, this separation is initiated or maintained at will by women. Here, Marilyn distinguishes separatism from separation that men command and impose on women for their own purposes. She sees the theme of separatism as ever and omnipresent in feminist practice, in everything from divorce to exclusive lesbian separatist communities, from shelters for battered women to witch covens, from women's studies programs to women's bars, from expansion of daycare to abortion on demand. She also sees it more tellingly as conspicuously absent in what she terms personal solutions and band-aid projects, like, she says, legalization of prostitution, liberal marriage contracts, improvement of the treatment of rape victims, and affirmative action. The theme of separatism, she suggests, distinguishes a radical from a reformist feminism. The topical question then is, why? Or what has separatism to do with power? Marilyn provides an interesting answer. She observes that power confers access. A parent has unconditional access to a child's room, but a child does not have unconditional access to a parent's. Total power then is unconditional access. Total powerlessness, unconditional accessibility. When women separate from men, they exclude them, and by excluding them, they seize control of access. They thereby assume power. The act of separation is thus the assumption of power, a power that is not properly theirs, qua women. I wonder if this is why Marilyn describes the act of separation as not only mean, but arrogant. Insofar as this power is not properly women's, qua women's, their assumption of it is an act of overreaching. This understanding of the act of separation as the seizure of control explains, Marilyn says, why this act appears a negative one, an act of no saying, as she puts it. We might wonder why this requires explanation. How could an act of separation be other than negative? But we can observe that when men exclude women, they do not appear to be engaging in a negative act. Why? Because they are not excluding women from that in which women ought be included. They are not denying women access to that to which women ought have access. Indeed, if the act of denial presupposes the legitimacy of the claim that is its object, then men are not denying women, for women do not properly have a claim to such access. Men are therefore not saying no. In contrast, when women deny men access, they deny a claim that men, qua men, properly have. However, if the act of separation is at first negative, it gradually ceases to be. Marilyn says, when we are in control of access to ourselves, there will be some no saying, and when we are more accustomed to it, when it is more common, an ordinary part of living, it will not seem so prominent, obvious, or strained. We will not strike ourselves or others as being particularly negative. I think we may restate this point thus. If the assumption of power that is the act of separation succeeds, then we women will have successfully laid claim to access. We will no longer be denying men, for men will no longer properly have a claim to access. The act of separation will no longer be a negative one. What is it for this assumption of power to succeed? For women's exclusion of men to become something with which men must reckon, something that they cannot simply dismiss. This act of separation is, in addition to being an assumption of power, an act of redefinition. As Marilyn says, the slave who excludes the master from her heart thereby declares herself not a slave. 
For one who is defined as powerless to seize control is for her to assert a new self-definition. How does this apply to women? Marilyn says, the term man has to shift in meaning when rape is no longer possible. When we take control of sexual access to us, of access to our nurturance and to our reproductive function, access to mothering and sistering, we redefine the word woman. She here suggests that the definition of woman is, at least in part, one who is sexually and perhaps also reproductively and emotionally accessible to men. In other words, sexual accessibility is built into the definition of woman. If this is so, then the act of separation, in particular the act of sexual separation, is an act of redefinition or, as men have defined woman, an act of self-definition. This calls into question whether many of what Marilyn identifies as forms of separatism are in fact such. That is, if the definition of woman is one who is sexually accessible to men, then presumably the act of separation must be one of specifically sexual separation in order to be one of redefinition. Why then do forms of separation such as divorce and shelters for battered women count as forms of separatism? Perhaps it is that any act of any act of exclusion is the portent of an act of sexual exclusion, the beginning that presages the end, so to speak. Notice an implication of this. If woman is one who is sexually accessible to men, and if the act of separating is the act of redefining woman as in control of her sexual accessibility, as sexually autonomous, then women must engage in the act of separation in order to establish the definition in virtue of which that act of separation is legitimate, in virtue of which, that is, women probably have control over their sexual accessibility. Women must engage in an illegitimate act in order to render that act legitimate. This provides a new explanation of the unease with which women regard the prospect of separation. They must do not only what their socialization into femininity has taught them is a crime against their natures, but what is in fact a crime. When women separate, they are doing the impermissible. If this explains why women feel unease about separating, it also makes clear that they have no choice but to separate. Only by separating do women establish the definition of woman in virtue of which their claim to sexual autonomy is legitimate, hence the legitimacy of this claim, hence the social arrangement of sex equality. We might think that women can bypass the act of separating by simply verbally asserting a new definition of woman. Marilyn thinks that we simply can't do this, that, as she says, we cannot from our isolation and powerlessness simply commence saying different things than others say and make it stick. We can, however, or so she thinks, re-pattern access to us. Some of the forms of separatism that Marilyn lists involve an individual woman separating from a man, such as divorce, while others involve women not only separating from men, but banding together with other women, such as all women groups. We might say that some acts of separation are individual and some collective. Marilyn doesn't make this distinction, but it strikes me that collective acts of separation are somehow and meaningfully different. I can see two differences. First, they shift relations not only between women and men, but also between women and women. Women are not only refusing to be for men, they are also choosing to be for women, to identify with women, to be responsive to and responsible to women. Second, their refusal to be for men is a collective one. It is the refusal of a community rather than of an individual. In identifying with women, they form a new community and in refusing, they speak as that community. Elsewhere in her work, Marilyn makes the point that, quote, meaning is something that arises among two or more individuals and requires some degree of agreement in perception and values. If the act of separation is ultimately an act of redefinition, then collectivity is essential to its success. Women must not only separate from men, but band together with women. Marilyn's analysis of separatism alters our understanding of its ultimate purpose and of its relationship to power. She cites Ty Grace Atkinson, who insists that we ought to give more attention 
to women's vulnerability to assault and degradation, and therefore to separatism as protection. Separatism as protection of women from male power, or perhaps more accurately from abuses of male power, does not challenge male power. Separatism as redefinition does. It is not a defense against male power, but an assumption of female power. It is not a reaction to men, but an originary action. Its reference point is not men, but women.